Hi, everyone. Welcome. Okay, I think everybody's in. Um, I'm sure we'll have some more join us, but I just wanted to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us. I am Patricia Tomlinson. I am the curator at the Appleton Museum of Art, and we're very pleased that you've joined us for the third Artist Outlook installation in our video series. And today we're very excited because we have a, a renowned artist with us. He's a wonderful person and a fabulous artist, and we're just thrilled that we have him here today, Clayton Pond. Um, I don't want to go too much into his background because he can say that better than, than I can, but we do have a small show of his work currently on view at the Appleton. So those of you who are able to get here, we invite you to come and see that. And do keep in mind, because of COVID-19, we are on limited hours now. We are Thursday through Sunday. So that's when we're open now. And um, I feel we get more people in, good, terrific. Welcome everyone. So um, I just wanted to go ahead and let Clayton tell us a little bit about himself for those of you who may not be familiar with him. So Clayton, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Well, where would you like me to start? <laughs> Wherever you want to. <laughs> uh, I had a, uh, uh, probably a fairly uninteresting childhood in that uh, I was raised in a nice suburb in Long Island. Um, and uh, what happened that was particularly interesting for me is that uh, while I was in high school, uh, Sputnik went up and we were all supposed to uh, become engineers and join the space race against the Russians. Uh, I didn't, wasn't real sure what engineers did. I knew they drove trains, uh, but uh, I was really interested in art from an early age. I used to do a lot of drawing and designing uh, designing houses and boats and cars and all kinds of things. Uh, I was went started off at a liberal arts school, uh, Hiram College in Ohio, and uh, uh, I was two years into school there before I was able to take my first elective course. And it was art because I'd been wanting to take an art course all along. Uh, and I really liked it a lot and surprised my parents by announcing that I wanted to transfer to an art school. And so I went to, uh, it was called Carnegie Tech at the time, it's called Carnegie Mellon University now. And I got my uh, undergraduate degree there. I had to start from scratch after two years, they made a freshman out of me again. I had to take design one and drawing one and so on and so forth and go through their curriculum. And then uh, I got a Master of Fine Arts degree at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. And that started my long tenure in the metropolitan area. I moved right from graduate school into uh, a part of uh, Little Italy on Broom Street and hence my Broom Street series of paintings. And I was there for about two or three years and then moved to Green Street I was one of the very early artists to pioneer the Soho area of New York, which is now a historic district. We lived illegally in uh, commercial lofts. Uh, the landlord knew about it, but uh, looked the other way. Uh, to give you an idea how desperate they were to rent the lofts in those days, the rent on a floor through in my building that I had, I had the whole floor all the way through the building. It was $186 a month back then. Um, and I spent about uh, 26 years there in New York uh, with my art career. Uh, I was very lucky. While I was in graduate school, I started exhibiting uh, limited edition prints all over the country and just making it a practice to enter every show that I heard about, and they were all juried shows. And uh, I discovered much to my amazement that I got into shows and won some prizes, and that was very motivating. And then uh, uh, I was doubly lucky, lucky just the fall after I got out of graduate school. Oh, before that, while I was in graduate school, I was picked up by the Associated American Artist Gallery, 
Sylvan Cole was the director then. Uh, a lot of people know who he is. He was the father of uh, printmaking dealers in those days. And he became kind of my professional daddy in a way. He would give me advice about how to, you know, talk to other art dealers and about the business part of it. Uh, the fall after I got out of graduate school, I was extremely lucky. I got connected with um, the uh, Martha Jackson Gallery in New York City. And at the time, she was one of the best galleries in the city. There were a handful, three, four, five of the best galleries, and she was one of them. And in addition to that, she was one of the very few of the top galleries who would even look at a young artist. So I was very fortunate in that regard to be picked up by them. And it's a very interesting story uh, how she found me. I, the, the spring before, while I was still in graduate school, I went by the gallery with my portfolio and uh, uh, they were having an opening at the gallery. And I said, well, this is not a good time to go in and try to show my, my work. So I uh, walked back out. The following fall, I was uh, in a very important printmaking show. Uh, my silkscreen prints were, got a lot of notoriety early on because of the number of colors that I use and the brightness of the colors. Uh, and it, a lot of the pop artists were starting to um, use silkscreen in a big way. The traditional printmaking mediums had been um, woodcut and etching and lithography, but they were starting to use a lot of uh, uh, silkscreen printing. And uh, they had a very important show of the pop artists, uh, a lot of uh, Indiana and Warhol and Oldenburg and you go down the whole list. These guys were all on the show. And then there was, they had one of my prints in there because they knew what I was doing. And uh, Martha Jackson came to the opening of that show to see the, the show and asked if she could meet me. So, uh, and so she was able to discover me rather than me putting myself on her. And, and what was particularly interesting is she said, well, how can I see more of your work? And so I'll be happy to show them to you when she said, well, could you come by? We're having an opening next, next Tuesday. Could you bring your prints by the opening? <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. So I brought my prints to the opening of the show and she spread them out all over the floor in the back office during the opening. And uh, she wanted to see my paintings and that's another story, but uh, she, uh, art dealers never, never leave, never left New York, never left Manhattan. They never crossed a river to look at paintings and my paintings were up the Hudson River at my cousin's place. So uh, uh, she said, well, I guess we'll just have to go see your paintings and uh, so anyway it was it was a fun story and I spent uh, I spent about 26 years in my loft on Green Street in New York City and then uh, I uh, married a lovely woman and we have two amazing children one is a piano player and a certified financial planner and my daughter is uh, a poet she's doing her doctorate degree at the University of Southern California. And uh, anyway, when they were little in first and third grade, uh, my wife got an opportunity to relocate to Atlanta. And we were looking to uh, move out of the city anyway for the children. Uh, so we wound up relocating here to Atlanta. I didn't think the commute was gonna be as far to New York as it turned out to be, but here we are in Atlanta. And we've been here for about 20 years now. And I have a studio, the entire lower level of our home is just my studio. And uh, I have doors that open up onto a patio. It's a ground level studio and there's a trees and a lake behind it, which is a lot nicer than it used to be out in New York, in New York City. Uh, so uh, we've been working here for quite a while now. That's wonderful. And we're gonna take a, a sort of a mini tour of Clayton's studio a little bit later, but I wanted to kind of get into the question. So I'm going to be, forgive me for looking off camera, I'm gonna be looking at, at the questions occasionally. Um, and oh, uh, incidentally, I wanna, before I forget, uh, please keep yourselves muted so everyone can enjoy. Um, and also at the end, we have allotted time for questions. 
via the chat feature. So if you have questions for Clayton, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will get to as many of those as we can at the end of our talk tonight. So I wanted to say that as well. So Clayton, I guess this is a really general question, so you can kind of go anywhere you want with this, but what is your creative process? Well, I, I look around a lot. I travel as much as I can. I, uh, when I have time, I like to do drawings. Uh, but if the subject is moving fast or if I'm having to move fast, I use my camera. And I take a lot of resource material with the camera. And uh, then I come back to my studio and I do composites from the photographs. I'll, I'll look at different ones and I work up uh, drawings. Uh, I like to have a fairly complete drawing before I start doing a painting or a limited edition silkscreen print. And uh, I sometimes, if I'm doing a silkscreen print, I like to work the colors out in advance, either on a drawing or in a painting. And when I do the painting, I transfer the drawing up onto the canvas and then start to work out the color problems on the, on the canvas. That's uh, my general, very generally, that's the process. Well, and I think that's a really interesting thing too. Um, I had the good fortune to visit Clayton's studio relatively recently, about a month ago. And it was really interesting. He starts with paintings and then does other things. So do you want to talk about that a little bit, if you would, please, Clayton? Uh, you mean the doing the vignettes from the- Well, uh... how, how I, I am more familiar with your prints uh -huh. and then then you showed me these marvelous large paintings so i thought that was really interesting how you go from large to small and just i kind of wanted everyone to kind of hear about that a little bit uh well with the with a number of the uh with a number of the uh prints for instance if i could turn the turn my camera a little bit here and show you one of the paintings uh that's a six by eight foot painting and uh that painting became the study for the print of a similar image. And uh, I worked out all the color problems in the large painting and then go down into the, uh, into the smaller print. And incidentally, that the print of that large format painting is in the show that I mentioned at the Appleton. So um, do come by and see that. We do have a wonderful little show of some of his prints. So we'd love you all to come. So another thing um, that a lot of people often want to know about the artistic process is do you work in every single day or do you work in spurts or how does that work for you? Well, what I'd like to do and what and reality is <laughs> two different things. Uh, I would love to be one of these people who could work from eight o'clock in the morning till you know five in the afternoon or something like that uh, on a very regular schedule but life comes in on you um, and there's always something else that pops up. Uh, I've, I work, uh, when I'm working on a piece, I like to put long hours in. Uh, I love to do long concentrated hours. Sometimes I won't start working till eight o'clock at night, but I'll work till 2 a.m. And then uh, the next day I might work for five or six hours. Uh, uh, and yesterday I worked for 10 hours on the painting. I was able to start early and work till late. Uh, so it, it really varies considerably. Uh, things happen. You have doctor appointments. Uh, you have, uh, you try to, you try to do exercise uh, every few, every day, you know, and that takes some time and shopping and, you know, just, I like to do my own yard work. It's good exercise. So there's all those things too that enter in. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, and I know a lot of us are kind of sick about hearing about COVID-19, but one of the things that I think is really interesting is when you speak to artists, and not only fine artists, but um, musicians and all of it, dancers, some people, especially during lockdowns, some people 
sort of withdrew and it was a more meditative time for them and they didn't produce art or didn't feel quite up to producing art. And then other people, it was an extremely productive time for them. Clayton, was this, how did this affect you? Can you talk a little bit about how you have been functioning during COVID-19 as an artist? Well, the dark side of it was that I, I uh, contemplated my mortality probably more than I ever have in my life before. Uh, but the bright side of it was that uh, it was actually really wonderful. That it allowed me a lot more concentrated time to work on my art. Uh, I spent, I was able to spend a lot longer hours on it uh, since we didn't travel or our social life was, was cut way, way down. Uh, and uh, it, it was just a good opportunity to get a lot more done. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, so also I wanted to talk before we get into a slideshow, because of course I want everyone to be able to see your beautiful art work as well. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on before we go to that is who or what are your influences? Do you have an active influence in your art that sort of drives you to do the imagery you do and such? I, I get this question often and I'm never really sure how to answer it. I, I, I don't have a particular champion that I emulate or uh, you know, try to be like, other than you might say that, uh, well, when I was an art student, for instance, uh, the biggest guy in the business at the time was Picasso. And uh, my work is not like him at, his at all, I'm, I'm not, particularly influenced by him other than in the sense that he would make art about a lot of things and he was he was incredibly productive. Uh, he, artwork just poured out of this guy. And I don't know if anyone can match his, his productivity level, but I always admired that and thought, gee, that would be really neat if I could do that too, you know? Um, and uh, between my two graduate school years, I, we had studied art history and, you know, from the books, so to speak, and you can only learn so much from a book. So d during my two graduate school years, I, I traveled all around Europe and went to as many museums as I could. And I just, I would just walk through the museums and wait for things to, to hit me. And uh, I just realized that how many different kinds of art and how many, uh, different styles of art and periods of art, how many things are considered great art? And I was trying, I was looking for the answer to what, what makes great art. And it's just so incredibly varied. And I came away that summer realizing that you could do anything and whatever you do, if you have conviction about it, if you believe in what you do and, uh, find out what's unique about yourself, that um, that's the best thing you can do as an artist. It's the truest thing you can do. And people will, if you do it with enough conviction, people will come to respect you as, you know, your vision is, is interesting and worth looking at and uh, valuable. I agree, those are wise words. Yes, I understand exactly what you mean, absolutely. So let's get into the PowerPoint. Bear with me while I get this up. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so let's talk about some of, oopsie, why is this not moving? Oh dear, hold on, bear with me. I'm sorry, I might have pulled up the wrong one. Um, let's see, that looked like the right one. Let's try this one. Okay, is that the right one? Oh dear, they're not moving. I'm sorry. I had practiced this and everything, everyone. I apologize. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah. There we go. It's, my computer's old, so that's there's that. <laughs> so Clayton, I mean, one of the things I wanted uh, to talk to you about as well is sort of your early work. This is one of your earliest pieces. Um, if you could just talk to us a little bit about this, how you did it, where you were when you did it, because I think that's a really interesting story. <laughs> um, I did this piece while I was in graduate school, actually. 
it, it started out as a five by seven foot painting, which ended up in a collection in Paris. And as I understand is now in a collection in Italy. And uh, what you're looking at right here is a print that uh, one of my very early silkscreen prints, one of the very early large silkscreen prints that I made uh, from that painting. And it's an image, I, I was, this was when I was traveling in graduate school, uh, I was in London at the time. And this was what I saw out of the window of a pension that I was staying in. And uh, I was probably feeling a little lonely at the time, but it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, subject matter. There's a, uh, uh, the implication, there's, a, there's two different rooms. The room on the left is, uh, as it looks like a woman taking her clothes off and in the room on the right is a guy who has no idea what's going in the room on going on in the room on the left uh, and there's uh, uh, a lot of detail in the print uh, all the, the brickwork and the chimney and the slate roof um, and there's there's also I, I'm using this is I'm using a lot of the, the colors one of the multicolor treatments here and it's also an example of uh, uh, one of the things they teach you. <laughs> when, I, when I was in high school, my parents were, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do for a living. And my parents had me take these aptitude tests at Stevens Institute in New Jersey. And, and I remember they had tests on all kinds of things. And I remember an art test they had, and they had different diagrams. You had to pick either the as, asymmetrical diagram or the symmetrical diagram. And, uh, uh, so I, I took the test, we went for the counseling afterward and they said, well, so what should I, what can I do with my life? And they said, well, they went down the list and said, well, you could do pretty much anything you want to do, and I, which didn't answer many questions. So I said, well, what about art? Because I remember having taken an art test and the guy says, well, that's the one thing I would advise that you do not do. <laughs> and I, re I remember that in the test, I picked all the symmetrical designs. And I guess if you were artsy, uh, you were not supposed to do that. You were supposed to pick all the, uh, asymmetrical designs if you wanted to do well on this test. But if you look at a lot of my work, uh, not everything, but a number of my, a lot of my pieces have uh, a lot of symmetry in them. So that's kind of a, a fun take on it. Absolutely. And another thing that I wanted to point out to everyone watching as well that I think is really interesting about what you do in your process. I love your perspective. I'm going to wax wax poetic about your perspective and probably a fair amount tonight. I love the fact that you zoomed in on this specific portion of a house that is across the way. So you didn't show the house, which wouldn't have been even remotely as dynamic as you zooming in on this portion. And of course, you mentioned the symmetry as well that gives it balance. But I, I really like some of the dynamism that you come up with with your perspectives. I find that really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of patterning also in there, a lot of, a lot of things going on, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And also one of the things I do in a lot of my work is uh, uh, do change the space. I'll have a drawn perspective, but I'll alter this, the space by uh, reversing the art rule that, uh, uh, cool colors should be in the background and warm colors should be in the foreground and I'll switch that around entirely. And in this particular piece, you see the sky is an orange color, which, you know, should be going back in space, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's a warm color. So it wants to come forward. So playing with the colors like this, create a, a visual tension that uh, creates uh, energy in the work, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go on to another one. Now this is a little teaser because in addition to being representational, you like to flirt with non-representationalism. Right. So I wanted to show this without any title or anything to see if people in their mind can come up with what this is a detail of. So I'm gonna give just a second here Everyone, please look at this and think in your mind of what this could be an extreme close up of. And now I'll go to the larger one. So it's a section of a paper garbage bag. So 
Clayton, do you want to talk about how your flirtation with the abstract versus the highly representational? Yeah, I uh, I always enjoy. I do a lot of my paintings are uh, like the entire an entire room. This particular piece came from a uh, seven seven by nine foot painting of a kitchen. It was called Rent Controlled Kitchen. I also did a silkscreen print by the same title. And underneath the sink uh, of the kitchen was a paper garbage bag. And uh, very often when I'm working on a large painting, I see, uh, I get involved in one small area and I'll think, whoa, that would make a really neat piece all by itself. So I'll take a vignette from the big painting and make a smaller painting of it. Um, I can show you a couple of examples too of that. Uh, I've been doing a large, uh, a new series of paintings uh, uh, of a limestone quarry in Ohio in cooperation with the National, uh, National Limestone I'm Stone Company. Um, and I have some very large paintings that are in the background, but this, this is a vignette from one of the big paintings. So you can see it's, uh, they get very abstract sometimes and it's very, very difficult to tell what, what it is. And that's okay with me because I'm really involved even when I make a large piece that has a lot of recognizable subject matter to it. Uh, I'm really, uh, you know, thinking about the color and the, the, uh, the composition and all the other things that make a painting. And uh, sometimes I get as much joy out of a, just one small part of it as I do out of the whole painting. And sometimes in a large painting, I see many other really interesting small paintings. It, and I've always done this all through my through my career, I've always uh, kind of gone back and forth between the recognizable subject matter and then vignettes that are less recognizable. Okay, so let's move on to this one. And I love the story behind this one as well. So you want to tell our viewers why you were doing exactly my bathtub faucets in Africa? Yeah, in the late 1960s, I was uh, sent to Africa on a uh, the international art program of the Smithsonian um, had a program for a traveling exhibit of American prints. And it was sponsored by the State Department. And I was supposed to go to East Africa and administrate the, uh, the uh, exhibition and conduct a silkscreen printing workshop with local artists. And, uh, and also, um, you know, lecture about about uh, American art, and uh, the, ironically, the uh, it was during the Middle East crisis, and the, the the prints never actually showed up. They got lost in Cairo or someplace. So there I was in East Africa with uh, <laughs> I had the uh, silkscreen printing equipment, and I had all my slides for lectures. So I did a silkscreen printing workshop and lectures. And the more the night before, I was going to. Uh, I was in, uh, I believe it was in uh, uh, Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, at the university there. I was going to do a, a demonstration print for the students. The idea was to work alongside of them, tell them what I was doing. They would be making a print. I would be making a print. The night before, I, I didn't have an idea. I, I wanted to do something. I didn't have a really good idea, and I was sitting in the bathtub trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do the next day. And uh, my next piece was staring me right in the face. So I got a <laughs> pad of paper and a pencil and I got sat back down on the bathtub and I drew up this piece and went in the next day and made this print. Now this is the, an example of the reverse. I did the print and I made it in Africa. It's called my bathtub faucets in Africa. Uh, and then when I got back to New York, I made a, a painting version of it also. So in this case, I did the print first and then the painting. Okay, and then I wanted to show everyone this as well. Another thing that I think is really inter interesting about your art is you, you paint pretty much paint 
a lot of the time, you paint the world around you, which of course is very ancient. I mean, even the ancient Egyptians did that on tombs. They painted the world around them, people driving cattle and things like that and parties and whatnot. So I think that you, you really humanize your art and you really kind of take it to the next level with the color, which we'll get to. But I, that's part of what I think is really charming about your art is you, you tend to look at your faucet, you tend to look at your kitchen, and then you render it. So look, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, this gets back to my being raised in the suburbs in uh, Long Island. It was, uh, you know, a sort of normal type house. I don't have any really interesting stories to tell about my childhood and all. But when I got done with graduate school, I moved into a loft in, in New York. And this is kind of what it looked like. There were all these raw pipes hanging from the ceiling and um, everything was hanging out. It was industrial, the brick, brick walls, nothing at all fancy about it. The gas space heater up there on the ceiling, which was very noisy and heated unevenly. And all these things were kind of fascinating for me. And uh, so I started to just, you know, found a lot of interest in painting my immediate environment and uh, in a joyful way. And uh, you can see, I don't know if I can, I can't point to it on here, but over the stove, there's a sign that says, think happy. And this is the sign that's over the stove. And there's a little story behind this. When I was in graduate school, I had my ups and downs and wondering why I was there and what I was doing and what life is all about and all that. And I get myself a little depressed once in a while. So <laughs> I made this, I painted this sign and put it up in my studio. Every time I got a little depressed, I paint, put another color on it. <laughs> and uh, I kind of had this sign hanging around my studio ever since. And it's it's kind of one of the themes of my work is uh, to you know remember it's it, my work is is a lot about joy. It's about uh, joyfulness and uh, and fun. You know, having fun in life and looking at the bright side of things, if you will. Not to be a, that's kind of a pun, but <laughs> so let's this is the perfect segue let's talk about color because obviously it's very vibrant it's extremely saturated um does your do the particular choices of color that you use mean anything to you specifically like for example does red mean something to you versus blue mean something to you talk about your your choice of color please well Color is a, a very, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to work with. It's really, it's a whole, it's like you got, you know, the, the normal three dimensions you've got, uh, and, and I don't know, I think of, almost think of color as a, as a fourth dimension in a way. Well, time, I guess it's supposed to be the fourth one now, but okay, the fifth dimension, whatever you want, but <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's a very interesting thing. If you had, if everything in the in your room was painted red, everything, you would have no concept whatsoever of color. And you wouldn't have any concept of it until you introduced another color that was different than red. Then all of a sudden you would see, oh, there's red and there's this other color. So no one color by itself means very much. But when you put the colors together, you can create all kinds of exciting things. And for me, working with these brighter colors and the interaction of colors, it, it creates energy uh, and visual stimulation. And I really love it when I look at one of my pieces or somebody looks at a piece and, and you get a little up, uplifted by looking at it and, and you're visually stimulated. I mean, there's a lot to see and you can get involved and you can just go down to one little part of the piece and look at the way two colors vibrate against each other. Or uh, you might go in a large field or you might go down to a detailed area. Uh, there's just a lot of things going on that's very exciting with color. Uh, and it's, it's just a lot of fun for me to do it. Wonderful, oops. I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, I wanted to, I'm gonna go back actually because I wanted to talk about uh, some of your 3D work as well. Yeah. So obviously this is a print and it's your your own creation of a classic column. This column does not exist. This is a Clayton Pond uh, 
column. Well, actually, it does? Yeah. Yes. well, they wouldn't. <laughs> they uh, where I lived in Soho, the buildings, including my own, were uh, had cast iron fronts. They realized at one point in architecture that they could make the column. The they used to have a lot of brick between the windows. They could make them much narrower with a uh, metal column, and they made made them into these. Uh, Greek columns. The uh, Soho is a historic district now because of these uh, uh, Greek looking uh, cast iron columns. Uh, what's interesting though is a lot of them are unlike anything that the Greeks would actually have done. Uh, they, the Greeks never made square columns, they never made flat columns, and very often they were combinations of, of different col columns. They were really, I guess you could use, if you pardon the expression, bastardizations of what the Greeks and the Romans did with columns. Uh, consequently, the, uh, the titles, I made up my own Latin titles, kind of got even with my high school Latin teacher here. But <laughs> I, uh, I made uh, kind of fun titles. Uh, this one is Ionic Involute, meaning that they curl in, and Upwardian means the curls go up instead of down. I have another one called Downwardian. Uh, and the... Uh, they were, the subject matter was for, the, I did a suite of these prints as well as some paintings, but the, uh, the suite of prints, they're, they're all done with what I could see right from my own fire escape. Some of them were my own building, some were across, directly across the street, some up one side and down the other. Uh, but I had a lot of fun playing with, and it, it really kind of, uh, it's a, it's a hor historic document of, of that part of New York at that time. Uh, and I think you're going to show the next piece is a three-dimensional version of that. Now, this is about almost four by four feet. Uh, and it's, it's all carved. Uh, it's cut out of, uh, made out of uh, aircraft birch plywood that I, I cut with a saber saw and then rounded all the edges. A lot of craft work involved. And it's done in layers. So it looks, it's very three-dimensional. It's a, it's a sculptural piece, painted sculptural piece. And I love doing those things. Uh, I, I have done some very large construction pieces in that manner also for, on a commission basis. Oops, I'm sorry, I am jumped the gun again, I forgive me. Uh, one right. of the things I wanted to jump in and say is it is hard to, it's a little hard to see in this format, the 3D, the, the dimensionality of this, but it's, they're, they're amazing. They're really cool. <laughs> I can't think of a better word. It's just really fun to see these three dimensional yeah. offshoots of the print. I've, all, I've also done some three dimensional pieces, painting them on plexiglass, multi layers of plexiglass, where you look through it and you see these different parts of the painting at different levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful. So I want to play the game with everyone again. So these are extreme details of something. So I want you all in your mind's eye again to think of what these could be extreme details of. So think about that. Look at the colors, look at the shapes and how he's rendered them. Think about what these could be. These are actually bracing silks. And Clayton, unsurprisingly, has a really wonderful story about them as well. <laughs> In 1981, I was asked to do a commission for the Kentucky Derby race. Uh, and I did a, about a, I believe it's about a five by seven foot painting of what you see here, pretty much, pretty much this image and uh, also a limited edition print and also a poster. The, I'm not sure where the painting is right now. If anyone knows, I'd love to find out. <laughs> the uh, limited edition prints were published by a publisher and the posters were I, uh, given out and I, I signed them. At, I went to the uh, Governor John Y. Brown's uh, Kentucky Derby parties and uh, signed posters for various of the guests. The, this image was used on the 
Derby breakfast morning party, I think there were several thousand of them sent out. Uh, it was a very large event. So it was, uh, it was a fun thing. Most, now most, uh, in the past, other artists have done things for the Derby and they're usually, uh, you know, a horse running across the field or something, but, uh, this is kind of where I went with, <laughs> with the horse racing thing. I, I love the, uh, the idea of all the bright colored and patterned, uh, jockey silks that the jockeys wear. So I kind of honed in on that aspect of the racing. Uh, this is kind of a lead in too to a lot of the leisure time pieces I did where um, it, they portray people in the state of the art of what they do, the way, the look of, of a sport rather than the sport itself. Uh, and then the, uh, the small paintings you saw there were vignettes that were taken out of that larger painting. Mm -hmm. And you gave, once again, gave me the perfect segue. So these are some of the Leisure Time Obsession series. And these are the series that we have on view at the Appleton right now. And I wanted to talk to Clayton a little bit about those too, because once again, the story is really interesting, how he came up with this, how he decided what imagery to use. So Clayton, if you'd like to tell everyone a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I, uh, I spent some time traveling all around the United States. I, I had a, I took a sociology class in uh, undergraduate school when I was in Ohio. And the, uh, one of the things I learned that, you know, we studied about culture and then the idea of subcultures within a culture, there were all, there were subgroups. And uh, for the first time in the history of the world, uh, you know, in, in general terms, people had enough time and enough money to indulge in leisure time activities. We had gotten past where we, all of our energy was, used to be a uh, survival of eating and, and uh, not being killed by a dinosaur or something. So <laughs> anyway, we, 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 a lot of people get involved in, in particular sports activities or other kinds of activities that involve a, a certain look to them. Uh, and I grew, grew into this, uh, curious about this because of my interest in, in sailing. And I noticed that even within the genre of sailing, there were uh, uh, the sailboat guys and then there were the motorboat guys and they stayed at separate marinas, you know. Uh, but you might have a guy who has a sailboat and on that sailboat, he's dressed a certain way. And he uses a certain language. Uh, there's all kinds of nautical terminology that you need to know if you're gonna be a sailor. And uh, there's an etiquette to sailing. And all of these things are determinants of a, of a culture or a subculture. The very next day, or even later that afternoon, he might get off the boat and go to the golf course. You dress a different way. You don't wear your sailing clothes to the golf course. You dress a different way when you go to the golf course. There's a different language at the golf course. You got to know a lot of terminology and the, and the golfing rules. And uh, there is an etiquette in golf. There's a way you behave on the golf course at the golf club. So these are very definite characteristics. And then uh, the same guy, uh, the next day might go to a car club and, and uh, you know, show his antique car or something like that. So there's uh, people jump in and out of these different things, but the, the idea of the leisure series was to show people doing what they love to do the most and looking the way they want to be seen doing that. The, uh, the high state of, of the art, the high look of, of doing it. And the equipment has to be just right in a lot of these things. If you're, if you're a skier, you wanna show up at the ski slope wearing the right thing and having all the right kind of equipment and all that. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And uh, I, did a, I did a number of paintings and prints and in particular a suite of about 20 prints that uh, it's not a suite per se, but it was, a, it was a, a series of about 20 prints. But there were some other pieces also outside of that that dealt with this leisure series. 
And one of the things I think that's really interesting, once again, getting back to actually how you portray this, is you lend a real feeling of dynamism by having the imagery jump out of the picture plane. So for example, up here, it's the parachute is busting out of the rectangular frame to, and it lends a real dynamism to the piece, your angle, he's almost coming down upon us. So I think that's really fun too. These, there are some more static pieces in the Leisure Time Obsession series, but a lot of them are very dynamic and you can almost in your mind's eye, see this guy coming down, down, down out of the <laughs> sky. And I think that's really wonderful as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, it was really fun watching these people. This. It, I never saw this before. This was down in Florida, the, the parachute one. And they would jump out of an airplane. I went to see this thing, it was a contest. And there's a, a circle of chairs with a little wooden disc in the middle. And I thought, no way. And sure enough, these guys come all the way down from plane and they put their foot right on the wooden disc. Uh, They're able to steer these kites. So each one of these sports has uh, a lot of technology involved that you, know, you, you study and you learn about. And a lot of times they, they're, they're missionaries about it. They want everyone else to do it. And I, I remember wanting going to one place in uh, Sandia, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they were jumping off a cliff with hang gliders. And they said, hey, you want to try it? And I said, no. <laughs> I studied these things beforehand and they had, a, they had kind of a higher death rate to uh, hang glide in than some other things. So I, so I, I knew what, what not to do. <laughs> but, um, it's fascinating. Yeah, but the, the three-dimensional thing, I, I, I like to break the image. I'm, I'm always a little frustrated by the two-dimension thing, and I like to, to break that again. with the, It's, it's a, almost a, per, a perspective kind of thing, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. And here is one. I mean, the, the figure, for example, isn't actively riding on the dirt bike but you see everybody, maybe he's at the starting line because clearly he's racing by the number here. He's at the starting right line about to go with everyone lined up behind him. And I like how you really incorporate a lot of the line work too. So you've got the vibrant main figure and then you've got line work behind them that gives an extra dimension to the scene and what is going on. Do you want to talk about that a little bit as well? Yeah, I mean, here's the guy almost posing for me in a way, you know, I mean, these were candid shots, but he's, he's waiting, you're absolutely right, he's waiting for the start of a race and he's, he's all done up, you know, and all the right stuff. Yeah, you know, and, and in the background, you can see the orange and there's a blue line work in there. And that shows a lot of what was going on in the background while he was, while he was uh, waiting there and is treated in an entirely different way so as not to it gives an indication of what's going on, but it doesn't, it's not to distract from him and his, his bike. Mm -hmm. And once again, though, even though he is a calm, this is the calm before the storm, so to speak, you have him, of course, still busting out of the picture plane, his helmet, yeah. his handlebar and the tire. So you yeah. still have that exciting feeling, even though he's not literally moving, which I think right. is really interesting. Okay, so that is it for our slides. Um, let me see if I can get out of here. There we go. <laughs> um, so now would be a good time if people are, we're going to chat some more, but if people have questions, now would be a good time to start putting those in the chat section, please. You can just simply type them in the chat. Um, we're happy to, to take questions, but I wanted to also ask you a few other things. Um, for example, we are, of course, part of the College of Central Florida, so we do have students and young people that are involved with us. What is your best advice that you would give a student or an emerging artist that wants to become a professional artist, Clayton? Well, I, I think it's really important. Um, there's there's different aspects to this. One, one is the artist. And in that sense, uh, and the other might be that if they want to be professional artists, you're talking about the business of art, perhaps. Um, I think on the artist side, uh, you want to discover what is unique about you. Uh, find out how you're different from everyone else. And 
and you want that to come out in your own work. Uh, I've done a little bit of uh, teaching early on, and uh, I've done some uh, guest lecturing at colleges and universities, uh, guest artist situations, and I used to uh, I used to tell my the students that uh, well, a lot of teachers like like it when their students work the way they do. They teach the way they know how to make art, and the students all kind of look like the teachers work. I say a quick way to get an F in my class would be to do that. Uh, if your work looks like me, then you haven't thought much about, about you. And what I wanna see, if you're going for an A in this class, is I wanna see how you're different from, from me and everyone else. I wanna see um, what sets you apart. And, and I, wa I want that to come through somehow in your art. You can't expect it to happen right away if you're an art student, but you know, if you think in those terms, how am I different and what, I, what do I want my art to be about? I think that's really important. Um, you also want to enjoy your art. I, I have a lot of fun making my art and it seems like, you know, if, if you don't have fun doing what you do, there's not a lot of point in doing it. It's, it's really great when you can find something that you, you enjoy doing and, and uh, pursue that. Um, on the professional side of it, uh, I think uh, one of the most important things to keep is to uh, learn to um, not not care about rejection. You have to you have to just forget that ex it exists. You have to uh, uh, not worry about being rejected anywhere. You just do what you do. And love what you do, and if and you can't think about who's going to buy your art or uh, anything like that. I think for I, one thing, I've noticed that for whatever you make, whatever anyone makes, there is a market for it somewhere. If you have to find your market for it, um, also you have to uh, learn to wear different hats, and by that I mean. Well, you have to uh, not take yourself too seriously when it comes to your art. Uh, you know, be serious about your art, but it's not the only thing in life. And you have to wear different hats sometimes. When you're in your studio making your art, you're the artist and it's all about the art. But then sometimes you have to uh, wear your promotional hat and get out there and if, you, if the idea of your art is to communicate, you need to get it out there. And that requires your doing something because nobody else cares as much as you do. And sometimes you might have to wear the salesman hat. Sometimes you might have to wear the lawyer hat where you're sitting down with somebody to do a contract with them. You have to read a contract. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to do the, if you're lucky, you have to do the accountant part, <laughs> uh, keep track of things. And uh, then you also have different parts to your life. You might have a family, you might have a spouse, um, and you have other things that are really important in life. And you need to understand that that has a very important place in your life too. So you need to departmentalize a little bit and not get too precious about your art in a sense. Uh, when an art dealer comes to your studio, to look at your art, he's looking at it in a little bit different a way than you do. And it's, it's good if you can understand where that person is coming from, it'll help you to understand what motivates them and you'll have a better relationship with them, I think, if you do that. But, uh, you know, work hard and, and just have a lot of fun with it and don't take yourself too seriously. Excellent advice. Okay, we have some questions that are coming in. One person asks, it's regarding the precision on your paintings. Do, does your canvas surface end, how to explain this? Basically, do you, does your imagery wrap around the sides of your canvas or, or is it just the rectangle or the square that we see? <laughs> That's an interesting question because uh... People see the front of a canvas, and when it's reproduced, that's all you ever see. 
but sometimes, uh, a lot of times I'll paint right around the side of the canvas, not the whole painting. Sometimes it's just the background color and then the, the other stuff comes up to the edge. And uh, uh, yeah, I can, <laughs> like on this painting, <laughs> I, I did around the edges a little bit here, but on some paintings, I'll, I'll just, I'll not do that. I'll, sometimes it'll just be black around the outside and I'll paint up to it. So it doesn't, it just, it depends on uh, what I'm working on. And it could be, some of the pieces could be hung without a frame and look very interesting that way. But if they get framed and that gets covered up, it's, it's okay. Okay, fair enough. Barbara writes, what inspired your color palette? And she also says, by the way, I remember seeing your work at the Port Washington Library in the 1960s. Ah. Port Washington was my hometown. And when I was a young artist in New York City, um, I was invited to do a show out there at the library. That's interesting. Um, what in, what inspi inspires me to use what the colors? Yeah, what inspired your color palette? Um, well, I when I was a, a young student, I did a lot of black and white prints and, and the subject matter was quite gruesome. And, uh, you know, fields of dead bodies. And then we got into the Vietnam War and everything. And I don't know, I just working with colors. When I started working with color, I just kept going to the <clears throat> to the uh, bright colors and they're, they're joyful. I just, uh, they're uplifting. And uh, it just makes me feel good to work with the bright colors. And again, the energy that they create is, is, is fun for me to work with. Well, and I want to tell everyone, um, I, I do encourage you to come look at the show at the Appleton in person because his colors are very vibrant. They, they sometimes almost kind of shimmy at you. They're extremely fun and very vibrant. And seeing them on a screen as you're doing now is not the same as seeing them in person. That's for sure. So... Okay, we have another question. Catherine asks, do you feel sad when you finish a painting? Um, I have mixed emotions after I finish a painting. Uh, sometimes I do feel a little sad. No, I'm not sure if sad is the right word, but I feel a little empty and a little let down. And uh, it, especially if it's a small piece that I spend you know, a week or two on, it's not so bad. But if it's one of the one of the big ones like behind me here, it's that take three or four months and I work long hours on them. Yeah, sometimes I, I just, I get into a kind of a funk and I wander around and, and uh, wonder what I'm gonna do next. <laughs> so I go out and do some yard work or something, but uh, yeah, it's a, it can be a little bit of a letdown and uh, you have to pick yourself up and start the next project. I think it's because it's, it's such an intense involvement with a piece that uh, it becomes your raison d'etre. I think, I don't know, I probably mangled the pronunciation, but the, uh, you know, it becomes your reason for getting up in the morning and for being alive and for, for being there. And you go and you do work on this painting and then all of a sudden, and well, it's not all of a sudden done. Sometimes you're never sure if it's really done. That's another interesting question that, um, how do you know when a painting's finished? But that's another story. But uh, you know, so when you when you get all done and you sign the piece and you're finished, uh, um, it's it is it is a letdown sometimes. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Um, oh, one just popped in. Here we go. Michael asks, in the age of social media, have you outsourced exposing your art to any social media platforms such as Instagram? Yes. Um, one of the uh, best things that is available to us now that didn't used to be is uh, having a website. And I'm very fortunate that my wife and my children are, are fairly well versed on that. And I, we've gone and had some uh, professional uh, web designers, a couple of them. Uh, work on my website. It's it's claytonpond.com, uh, and if you forget the .com, if you just Google my name, it it comes up. 
But uh, yeah, I think it's a great tool uh, for young artists too, as the starting artists to uh, have something online. Uh, and, and my wife and my daughter have been, have done a little bit of uh, the social media stuff. I, I, I'm not there with it, but uh, thanks to them, there's, there's a, what, what do you call it? The different ones that Facebook, Facebook and all that. Yeah. Um, but the, the website was originally designed to uh, document all of the limited edition prints that I've published. It has a lot of the detailed information that people might want to know about the prints if they're interested in it or if they have one or museum collectors and all that. Um, but, and we've just started to put some of the paintings on. It's not a selling site per se, it's just, a, it's a more of an informational site. And, and it's really great. It's it's really fun to to see all your work on that site. Um, incidentally, uh, we just put that up in the chat. So those of you who want to go to that website, we just put it up there as well. So and Catherine helpfully added your Instagram link as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I that's so far. That's mo oh, well, someone asks if there will be a recording of this interview. Yes, this is being recorded. And I will um, slightly edit some of the beginning stuff because it starts recording the minute we get on before we start talking. So I'll need a moment or two to edit, to get it, and then we will definitely put it on. We have it on our Appleton Museum of Art YouTube channel. So be on the lookout for that. But yes, this, will, this is re being recorded currently and this absolutely will be, will live on our YouTube channel after the fact. So any other questions before? It doesn't look like any one other are coming in. Clayton, was there anything else you wanted to add or say at this time? Well, uh, my recent work, I've been working for a couple of years now, several years on a project for the National Lime and Stone Corporation. It's uh, in cooperation with them. They allowed me to go down and <laughs> In the quarries and do a lot of study work and uh i've been those, those are some of the pieces in the background the uh the long plan is to eventually have a show at the uh, marathon performing arts center in finley ohio which is where the company is based and then hopefully maybe this show would travel um, and that's that's been a lot of fun for me to work on that project i can uh i can show you a little bit around the studio if i turn my Turn my projector around. This this piece here is a, a large piece that I did for the uh, a special exhibit on Halley's Comet uh, for the Air and Space Museum in 1985. Uh, Halley's Comet. They asked me if I would do this piece for them, and uh, it's uh, I, I I felt that the, the this this time around the comet came around. The previous times it came around, there was no television. So I figured more people would see the comet on television than, than with the naked eye. So that's why, and we also didn't have the shuttlecraft and the Hubble telescope and all that the last time the comet came around. So that was kind of a fun thing to do. That is fun. It's wonderful. A couple more just came, questions just came in. Uh -huh. um, Griselle asks, is there one painting you've sold that you wish you could get back or see again? Well, yes, uh, that's an interesting question because uh, sometimes I've had some early pieces sold and I, I didn't even take a photograph of them in the early days or I have a very poor you know, slide I took of it. And uh, I have no idea where some of these pieces are. Uh, there's one I would like to have back that's, I'd like to have it back undamaged. I heard that it was totally, large early piece was totally destroyed. And I've had a couple of pieces stolen that I'd love to have back. So yeah, it's uh, you know when you it's and it raises a question, a philosophical question too about art in general. Uh, when when the uh, art leaves your studio, uh, you don't have any control over how well it's cared for. And I understand that um, museums like yours, uh, Patricia have guidelines for protecting art. 
And uh, that's a really wonderful thing if your art, your art ends up in a place like yours where it's, you know it's going to be well cared for. Uh, but when it's in a private home or it gets, uh, changes hands, sometimes the collector will buy something, you know, might know who it is, but then it might wind up with their children someday or somewhere else. You have no idea where it is. You lose track of where these pieces are. And it's kind of like your children leaving home and never coming back. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I can I can understand that and yeah, yeah we're, we're very proud of because it's an arduous process we're very proud of our American Alliance of Museums accreditation we're mm -hmm. held to certain standards we must renew that certification so you don't just get it once and call it good you have mm -hmm. to keep renewing it and showing that you're up to snuff as far as accreditation so yes that's it's a very important thing in the museum world and we have another question as well what do you think might inspire your next artwork after the quarry series anything you're noodling on i'm noodling on some things and i don't like talking about things that i haven't made yet because i'm not sure how well they're going to come out or whether i'll even do it or not i might do something else uh, but i do have some ideas yes Fair enough. Okay. And I'm looking forward to it. And then Drew asks, and I'm fairly certain this is your Drew. <laughs> your uh oh, uh -oh. this is, could be the hardest question. Yet. <laughs> he told me Drew not to not to ask any questions from the family. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one though. You'll like this one. Is there one painting you've sold that you wish? Oh, I already read that one. I'm sorry. Um, Hold on, I apologize. Um, what do you think might inspire your next work? Do you have, do you have an inspiration? I know you can't talk about, it, but do you have like an inspiration? Yeah, um, I think a lot of my ideas don't don't necessarily just pop into my head. They they usually come while I'm working. If I'm working on one thing. And that's one, one of the values about keeping working is that uh, more ideas come to me while I'm working. I'll be working on one piece and I'll think about, gee, I could do this and I could do that. And I'll, I'll make notes of these things and they lead into other pieces. Uh, once in a while, I, I, I get a, a, a brainstorm on, on something new, uh, but they're usually, usually evolving ideas. Fair enough. Um, here's another one from Arian. Your children both turned out to be amazing artists. How did you foster a love of the arts in your children? Oh, wow. Um, I have uh, a lovely wife who is very open to the arts. She, she played the piano uh, all during uh, college and she is an artist in her own right. She does amazing drawings. Uh, she studied art in Clayton. I think we're, so. We've we oh, we lost you for a second. The but, arts and, and encouraging of it. Oh, Clayton. Yes. It went a little wonky for a second. Can you repeat like the last couple of sentences? You sort of froze. Your something went wonky. Well, no, it's just that we've been, we've always been very open to the arts with our, with our children and encourage them. Uh, my, my son, for instance, is a start, you know, his love is piano and his, his career is uh, uh, sort of as financial planning, but I've always encouraged him, whatever you do, don't ever give up the piano because that's in your heart and you should always, you know, do that. My daughter loves reading and, and writing and she's a poet and, uh, uh, she does amazing work in, in, in that genre. Uh, neither one of them became painters, uh, which, which probably is, <laughs> we don't compete with each other. I don't play the piano and I don't write poetry. Yeah, oh yeah, we, of course we were raised, they were raised, their early childhood was in New York City and we, we go back there frequently. And, um, you know, they've been exposed to every museum there is when, when they're with me and my wife. So they've, they've had some good prompting. 
Wonderful. That, yep, yeah, that always helps. So I think that's it so far for the questions. Um, if there's anything else you wanted to say, because we're probably about at time, if you feel like this is a good place to wrap it up, but if you had more you wanted to say, you're more than welcome to do that. Well, I could go on, <laughs> but in the interest of time, I think we're, we're probably pretty good here. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Clayton. Thank you, Marjorie. Marjorie has been his engineer in the background. That's his lovely wife. <laughs> um, we appreciate you all for, co for coming. We appreciate your questions and support. I did want to mention that the next Artist Outlook is on December 17th, once again on a Thursday at 7 p.m. And the person that we'll be speaking with that evening is Max Stone, a very talented young photographer. He um, really seeks to highlight the environment and the fragility of our flora and fauna of our world in his work. He's worked for National Geographic. He's done all kinds of amazing things. So I think that'll be a lovely discussion with him as well. So Great. once again, thank you so much, Clayton. Thank you everyone for coming and look for us on YouTube. I'll get this out there quickly. Thank you. Good night.